we are honored to introduce our second keynote speaker, Nicola Evans from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. Nicola grew up in Hong Kong and only recently moved to the UK to assume her fascinating role with the foundation. She has pre-recorded a video for us and will be presenting on why the circular economy is more relevant than ever. Let's watch the video from Nicola. Hi, I'm Jo Stan from the UK. My name is Nicola Evans. I'm the communications lead at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And I'm here today to talk to you about the circular economy. It's a real pleasure and honor to have been invited here today to speak at Rethink 2020. Thank you so much for having me and I hope you enjoy the presentation. I'm going to talk to you today about not only the circular economy and the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, but also some of the things we have seen during the COVID epidemic that highlight how relevant the circular economy is today more than ever. I was born and grew up in Hong Kong. Most of my early memories are of life at the beach or in the pool, being given free lychees from the local shopkeepers in Wafu and generally having a wonderful childhood. When forced to think of my earliest memories of litter and pollution, I remember the small plastic pellets that would wash up on Stanley Beach and get caught in the rocks. I thought they were colorful and fun and I'd collect them. I remember fluorescent liquids spilling into the sea from the factories in Kuantong. And I remember animal carcasses circular, circulating around the ferry terminals, stuck in that unnatural cycle of the heavily reclaimed harbor, which hadn't been swum in for years because it was deemed too toxic. And I remember shopping at Dairy Farm, the precursor to welcome for those of you who uh, might not have been here quite as long, uh, never with a reusable bag. I'd be proud at how many plastic bags full of shopping I could carry on one arm. I never considered what would happen to the plastic. I also lived on Lantau for a few years in the 1990s and would visit regularly as a child. I'm the tall one on the left. Um, I loved the company of Lantau's wild cow herd and water buffalo. I just remember this haven of jungle, wildlife and a simpler way of living. I remember those beautiful white sands of Cheng Sa Beach and the untouched waterfalls that no one knew about. Fast forward to 2016 and this is Cheng Sa Beach. In fact, I've been back in Hong Kong for a couple of years at this point. I remember going to Poyo Beach for a day out and going to the water's edge and I could see where the plastic had gone. It's in our oceans, it's on our beaches. I couldn't swim in the water for the sheer amount of plastic. Many of you will remember that awful summer when quite literally tons of rubbish washed onto the shores. And many of you will be familiar with the ever increasing air pollution that forces us to stay indoors, the landfills that are full and the summer temperatures that now regularly touch 40 degrees. I don't know about you, but I don't remember any of this as a child. And these are all symptoms of a failed system. Take, make, waste. We take raw materials out of the ground, we make things, we use them, and we throw them away. The linear economy, that's what it's called, and it's efficient when it works. It has been highly optimized over hundreds of years, and many economies have done well. But it's also extractive, and it's wasteful, and it's responsible for so many of the global challenges we face. Plastic pollution, climate change, air and water pollution, biodiversity loss, food that has lost its nutrients because the land and the soil have been overfarmed. The linear economic system has damaged the very things we actually depend upon. So here we are today, COVID-19, which has impacted every corner of the world. It's a global, a global pandemic, sorry, that did more to show the brittleness of the linear system because of its speed and voraciousness. It has been unforgiving and unrelenting and it happened nearly overnight. It showed us that the system can collapse with small disruptions to what is a highly efficient and optimized system. That we are reliant on centralized models of production, on transport, and a relatively easy movement of goods to keep our economies and lives going. It showed us that things are often manufactured far away from where they are consumed, and if the supply chain is disrupted, shop shelves can go empty and medical equipment becomes unavailable. It showed us that we already knew all of this, 
and we were aware of the problems, but we weren't acting quickly enough to resolve them. For years, it feels as if we have been shadow boxing the problem. We've been making a show of tackling the problem, trying to fix things around the edges, instead of getting to the heart of the, of the actual issue, our economic system. A lot of sustainability talk has historically been written off. It's green, it's about tree hugging, it adds more costs to businesses. It isn't something that applies to our efficient business orientated machine. A lot of sustainability work has been about reducing the harmful effects of the linear economic system. And these have been incremental end of pipe harm reduction measures. There's also been a big focus on individual behavior and choice. Some of you will have seen this, uh, this advert after it went viral. I, I do love SodaStream. They are leaders in providing soda without the heavy plastic cost. And I think this is a really playful yet clear example of how we are often shamed as individuals because of our choices, which at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we don't believe you should be. We believe the system needs to change. Um, for those of you who have watched Game of Thrones, this will have more relevance than those of you who haven't. Change. 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 It's actually a three minute advert, so do feel free to go and check it out if you haven't seen it already. So if we're not going to shame people into changing their behavior, what should we be doing? At the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we want to inspire people and encourage them to work on solutions at a systems level. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. We don't believe anyone should feel bad about what they buy because we believe in a system that has been redesigned so that the things we make, purchase and use never end up as waste. The linear economic system is the problem and the circular economy is the solution. Our research has revealed the scale of the economic opportunity and we've demonstrated how businesses can benefit and thrive from a circular economic strategy at the heart of their operations. Our research has shown a $700 million annual material cost savings in the fast moving consumer goods, goods industry, a 48% reduction of CO2 by 2030, a $550 billion reduction in healthcare costs associated with our food sector, 3,000 euros extra disposable income per year for EU households, 70 trillion yuan savings for businesses and households in China by 2040, and a 47% reduction in traffic congestion in China's cities. Our vision is a new economic system that provides better outcomes for people and the environment. I thought I'd share some interesting stats that have helped to focus attention on some key areas such as mobility, plastics, fashion, and climate change. So, did you know that the average car in Europe is used only 8% of its life? Yet 50% of our city's land is devoted to roads, driveways and parking. Did you know that only 14% of plastic is recycled globally? And by 2050, our research showed there'll be more plastics in the ocean than fish by weight that one garbage truck of clothing and textiles is dumped or burnt per second. And last year, we released a paper focusing on the role of the circular economy in tackling climate change. It showed that only 55% of greenhouse emissions can be eliminated through a full transition to renewable energy. And even with the nationally defined contributions, we are nowhere near to hitting the one and a half degree target set by the Paris Agreement. No one is talking about the remaining 45% of greenhouse gases, and these are caused by the way we make and use things and our food system. Our research concentrated on just five key areas, food, steel, cement, plastic, and aluminium. 
to illustrate how a circular economy underpinned by a transition towards renewable energy can help tackle the overlooked 45% of emissions by transforming the way goods are made and used. By designing out waste, keeping materials in use and regenerating farmland, we can reduce these emissions by 9.3 billion tonnes in 2050. That's equivalent to eliminating all current emissions from transport worldwide. These examples provide a clear message to other industries such as fashion, electronics and packaging of the value the circular economy can offer. Diet shift, emerging innovations and carbon capture and storage are the final pieces required to complete the picture of how the world can achieve net zero emissions by 2050. And in addition to reducing emissions, the paper shows that the circular economy has the potential to increase resilience to the effects of climate change and contribute to the meeting of numerous UN Sustainable Development Goals. So we know what the problem is, but what is the solution? Well, we need to think differently. For the last 10 years, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has worked with business, governments, institutions, cities, and academia. These key actors have seen the benefits of this different system, the circular economy. The world's largest businesses have made commitments to transitioning their business models or adopting a circular economy for plastic, for example. Cities are adopting circular economy strategies. London, New York, Sao Paulo are three cities we are working with specifically on a circular strategy for food. Governments are using the circular economy for their framework towards climate change targets. In March, the EU released the Circular Economy Action Plan. On the right, you can see Ellen MacArthur, our founder. This was not in response to COVID. It was years of work in the making. And it wasn't derailed for something more important. It was recognized as being at the heart of the issue. The circular economy is a bigger idea. It's bigger than a particular product or industry. It's bigger than just recycling. It's about changing the entire system and finding solutions that can scale at speed globally. The following is a video I'd like to play for you that introduces you to the circular economy. We live in a world with finite materials. We are throwing an awful lot of electronics, plastic food, carpets, clothing away. It's a waste of precious materials. Uh, if we could build an economy that would use things rather than use them up, we could build a future that really could work in the long term. Yeah. You design the products in a way that can be taken apart once the consumer has finished using them. You remanufacture it and give it out again. You can reduce your production costs hugely if applied correctly. Instead of garments ending up in landfill, companies can repurpose it, reuse it, making profit out of their waste. Mm -hmm. We take some resources from nature and bring these back in the form of nutrients. It's very much a natural cycle. We use some less water in conventional agricultural methods. Our packaging is not a waste, it's something that we can consume and need. We redesign everyday products to make them fully recyclable. We farm as close to nature as is possible. The H&M Group has set ambitious targets to use 100% sustainably sourced materials. There is a lot of conversation about not buying clothes, but different models where you can rent clothing. We develop fully modular headphones that we offer on a subscription basis. The circular economy itself is inevitable in my opinion. It's not one fix, it's about the entire system being redesigned. This is to me the only way to fight climate change, to fight pollution, to fight waste. This is a business model that stacks up. Global companies cannot survive in the future without transitioning towards a circular economy. That is a really exciting future. As the name suggests, in a circular economy, there is no end of the line. Everything we make and use stays in use. It's circulated. There's no rubbish or waste because everything has value. 
products are made so they can easily be repaired, reused, refurbished, remanufactured, or even recycled, whichever keeps things at their highest value. Food is grown so that it nourishes and improves the soil, water, and air instead of damaging them. When is something circular? At the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, we believe the circular economy is built on three principles. Firstly, design out waste and pollution, by which we mean design products, materials, supply chains, and systems, so there is no waste and pollution as a result. Two, keep materials and products in use. Three, regenerate natural systems. A great example of the first two principles, design out waste and pollution and keep materials and products in use, is found in this true story. This light bulb has been burning continuously, except for a few power failures, since 1901. It's still lit up today, and you can find the Centennial Light at a local fire department at 4550 East Avenue, Livermore, California. Back then, light bulbs were built to keep on burning. In the 1920s, major light bulb manufacturers, including Osram, General Electric and Philips, formed the Phoebus Cartel. The cartel fixed prices, stifled innovation, and most importantly, colluded to make fragile light bulbs that would eventually burn out. Phoebus established a thousand hour standard for lamp life, enforcing obsolescence to pump up its profits at the expense of consumers. Economists consider the cartel's actions to be one of the most notable cases of planned obsolescence. But how things have changed. Phillips was asked to provide light at Schiphol Airport in Amsterdam, not light bulbs. By applying this new way of approaching light as a service, it became incumbent on Phillips to provide lighting in a way that saved them money and forced them to innovate. They are now motivated to provide long lasting lighting that is easy to repair and maintain. If you're in the system, you are part of the problem and therefore part of the solution. At the foundation, we engage with and inspire key actors, businesses, innovators, governments, and academia, and we mobilize systems solutions at scale. We believe that commitment, transparency, and accountability are key. For example, our new plastics economy has 850 organizations committed to a circular economy for plastics with ambitious targets set for 2025. Some of those organizations, I believe, are in the room today. And you can't improve what you can't measure. Our Circulitics tool launched this year allows any company to measure their progress and help their circular economy strategies. And over 600 have already signed up. Our membership consists of nearly 200 organizations who come together to learn, engage, and share knowledge in a pre-competitive environment with a wider network of nearly 2,000. And earlier this year, over 50 CEOs and leading figures signed a joint statement with us, published in the FT, committing to the circular economy and using it as a framework for better growth as we pull out of the economic impact of COVID. Many have already called for a response to the devastating impacts of this pandemic that does not detract from other global challenges, such as climate change and pollution. The circular economy offers a solution. By designing out waste, keeping products and materials in use and regenerating natural systems, it creates vital opportunities for economic growth that also restore the environment, create jobs and benefit society. So talking of looking at things differently, here's a photo of Hong Kong from a drone. Can you see yourselves? <laughs> um, by 2050, it is estimated that seven out of 10 people will live in a city. And cities account for 85% of global GDP generation and only 3% of global land surface. In the current linear economic model, they also consume 75% of global resources, contribute up to 80% of greenhouse gas emissions and 50% of solid waste production. But there are huge opportunities within cities to embed the circular economy using the money, innovation, knowledge and networks that cities bring together. Imagine a circular Hong Kong built to be modular and flexible so that space can be used in different ways. Imagine buildings that are designed to generate, not just use energy. 
imagine materials that are used to improve the quality of life for its residents and companies providing solutions and redesigning how they make and use things or money being invested into the businesses, innovators and infrastructure that all help support the circular city. We all have a role to play in leveraging Hong Kong's strengths, infrastructure, trade, transport, finance and people to rapidly become a beacon city for the circular economy. My heart is still very much in Hong Kong and I truly hope we will embrace the economic opportunity so that we can benefit from clean air, soil and water, as well as a healthy population once again. Thank you so much. On the same day Sir David Attenborough released his latest Netflix documentary, A Life on Our Planet, which was described as both terrifying and a short, sharp shock by The Guardian, we released our video uh, around plastics. And Sir David Attenborough, in fact, narrated that for us. Um, we're about to play it now. You can also find it across our YouTube channels and all our social media channels. And we do encourage you to share it. Thank you. By 2050, there could be more plastic than fish in the oceans. Yet the problems start long before plastic reaches our oceans, rivers and beaches. And so must the solutions. We must tackle this flood at the source. We must eliminate the plastic we don't need. We must innovate. So all the plastic we do need is designed to be safely reused, recycled or composted. And we must circulate everything we use, making sure the plastic we produce stays in the economy and never becomes waste or pollution. Join our journey to make plastic waste and pollution a thing of the past.